morning, folks. How's everybody doing? So I'm John Baker, founder, president, CEO of D2L. And uh, you know, when I when I came to this event, uh, my wife actually looked up the speaker list before uh, before me arriving, and she said, "So let me get this straight: uh, George Bush is speaking, uh, Titans of Industry." Uh, I said, "Yes." And this is a conference about uh, ideas that can help change the world. And I said, yes. Uh, and then she said, and so why are you going? <laughs> and I, uh, you know, that's the kind of support I get at home, folks. <laughs> at least I, I hope she was kidding. Uh, you know, for me, uh, when I started uh, D2L, it was with that uh, mindset. What is the idea that I can work on uh, that can actually have a transformational impact on the world? And so today I want to talk to you about three things. I want to talk a little about the founding of the company. Uh, I want to share some of the innovations that we've been working on as a company. Uh, and most importantly, and, and, and for the most of the talk today, I want to talk about the future of learning uh, and what we need to do uh, as an industry, as, a, as all of us as leaders in this room, uh, to really advance learning uh, to solve some of the biggest challenges in the world. So, so to get started, uh, I'm going to rewind the clock to 1998. I was in my third year of university, uh, and at that time, uh, it, we were given an open-ended design project in our engineering class, which was go find a problem, not go solve a problem, but go find a problem, and then solve it. Uh, and I can tell you as engineers, you're, you get very comfortable at just solving problem after problem after problem. You get really good at that. Uh, but this knocked us out of our comfort zone. Uh, we had to go off. It was almost like taking off our hard hat as an engineer and putting on our jungle gear and go into the wilderness and find something magical. Uh, and it took us a, about a month to come up with one problem that our team could actually agree upon uh, that we would go off and work against. Uh, and in that case, you know, once we got that problem, we were back into our comfort zone uh, and working on the reinvention of crutches. You know, we built prototypes, we uh, tested them in labs, we proved that our new design for crutches were better than the old design, uh, and we won more awards. But for me, that problem, that challenge that that professor gave us actually unlocked something else in me, which was, you know, what's the biggest challenge that I could work on uh, that would have the biggest impact on the world? What, what was that idea? Uh, and for me, I couldn't think of anything bigger than trying to transform the way the world learns. Uh, and just to give you some context, my brother, who at the time uh, was taking a, a distance education course, uh, and in, th in that case, it was cassette tapes and faxing and assignments, and, and, and not too far off Morse code and carrier pigeons. Uh, and you could see the impact of the web coming along, uh, and it was the ability now to, to how do we leverage, the, harness that technology to truly have an impact on learners all over the world. Uh, but learning is also different. It's not transactional in nature. You don't just buy something and then you're done. Learning has this ripple effect. Not only does it affect the student you're working with, but it ripples through their community. Uh, it ripples from one generation to the next. Uh, it leaves a lasting impact on our world. And I believe at the core, learning is foundational to all of our big challenges. You know, if you look at all the problems in the world, uh, if you boil them back down, learning's at the core of solving all of them. Uh, whether it's uh, economic challenges that we've got to uh, tackle, political struggles that we have to resolve. All of this is done through education, through learning. Uh, environmental challenges are only solved through learning. You know, these are big challenges uh, as a, a group we have to now uh, tackle. Uh, and, and if you, uh, if, if you try as a, as a student in 1999 to think about, well, how are we going to transform the way the world learns? That's a big daunting problem. Uh, and for us, it really boiled down to really two, two key things. How do we help make the learning experience better? Uh, and then two, how do we help reach every learner? Not just us, but our clients. Uh, and to me, when I, when I look at that, we, we originally started off uh, with how do we break down all kinds of different barriers to access? So what do we mean by that? We, we were the first in the world to build a fully accessible learning management system. So it was the first time that if you were blind or deaf, hard of hearing, visually impaired, you could participate equally with everybody else going through the course at the same time. Well, it's game changing. It still is game changing. We're, we're still uh, a leader in that space. 
Uh, we're also the first, and still in our space, the only that built a responsive web experience. And, and why? I remember being on a trip to India and visiting one of the poorest communities and watching uh, these girls in this class take out their smartphones and take a photo. Uh, and it was a, it was a light, lightning moment for me because I had to sit, put up my hand and say, well, how, how do you all afford smartphones? <laughs> we're, in, we're, in, we're in like the poorest slum in, the, in, in, the, in India. Uh, and, and, the, and the girl said, well, these are like third-hand phones. Uh, they're really cheap here, uh, and we, we pay like a dollar a month. Uh, and it you know, gives us the ability to take photos and connect to Wi-Fi. Uh, and for me, it was uh, sort of the dividing line between an app strategy and responsive web. And responsive web for me is, is a winner because it breaks down all the access barriers. It doesn't matter if you're in that poor slum in India or if you're using the latest iPhone or Android device, you have equal access to absolutely everything uh, on that mobile platform, if you will. Learning's now in your pocket. So th those are a couple examples of access barriers, but it, we didn't stop there. It was, you know, the, there was the first wave of this was the shift to digital, uh, moving everything online or supporting what we call blended learning in the traditional classroom. Uh, but, but you can't rest at that. Uh, and we, what we've been working on now is next generation pedagogical models. So how do we actually look at the heart of what's important in teaching and learning uh, and transform those models? So a, a great example of this is uh, leadership in competency-based education. So taking an old seat time-based model, like you heard, you heard the speaker earlier talking about a compliance model, S same thing in uh, corporate as it is in education. We were measuring things based upon approximations. And competency-based education is a great way for us to shift to a model of helping us understand what the student actually learns, what skills they actually have, uh, and then being able to provide the right remediation to get them right back on the right track uh, for success, and build the right foundation for them to go from one level of education to the next and into their, into their careers. Uh, it is a game changer. Uh, and you know, whether it's clients like uh, Southern New Hampshire University that are using this to shrink the amount of time it takes to get your degree and, and welcome people back from the workforce, or other clients that are using this as a way to develop mastery in nurses or doctors or engineers. Uh, this is, uh, I think, going to sweep through uh, every aspect of learning. But it's not just that. It's, you know, how do we incorporate video? How do we incorporate adaptive learning? Uh, how do we support uh, virtual reality? All kinds of different learning moments uh, being built around a common platform, if you will. Uh, and then we anchor ourselves off of uh, not just technology, but building a habit of mind around how do we actually truly have an impact on each and every one of these students. And in our case, we, we measure what we call our mission metrics. So these are how do we help you grow adoption? How do we support better learning outcomes? How do we drive better retention or completion rates? Supporting engagement, driving productivity, learner satisfaction. Uh, these are at the core of the work that each D2Ler does every single day. Uh, and if we can't demonstrate that we're making improvements in these, these areas, then we're, we're off doing something that's not on the right track for having a, a big impact. Uh, and so whether it's working with clients to, you know, for example, Alabama, Department of Education, we work with them uh, to set a goal of improving graduation rates for high school students by 10% in four years. Uh, and we achieved it in two. Uh, or just up the road at CSU Long Beach, you know, uh, when we first started working with them, uh, they had graduation rates in the 30s and 40 percent for students. Uh, now they're the showcase for all of the CSU system uh, for open access, inviting students in, and helping them complete and persist through their degrees. Uh, to a, a university down in, in, uh, in Australia where we worked on this large class size problem and we tried to tackle the, the, the concept of only 70 or 60 percent of students uh, completing that particular course, and we now have that uh, particular large class up to sometimes 90%, sometimes 98% completion rates, which has a huge impact on driving a, a real return on investment for uh, those universities. Uh, to large companies, where going in and, and driving a better uh, reduction in terms of turnover has a huge impact. So if you can have a better onboarding experience, uh, that drives uh, less people leaving the organization. And so at a company on the scale of Accenture, instead of onboarding 80,000 people now a year, you can onboard 60,000. Uh, and still retain the same size of workforce, saving millions and millions of dollars. So understanding you know, what the driver is is critical. 
I also think you've got to step back, and when you look at the future of learning, which is really getting into my third point, uh, what, before you can actually build the future of learning, you have to understand how's the, fu you know, the future of work or the future of education changing. Uh, and I think there's three main drivers in workforce today. So the, you've got the rise of the gig economy, you've got the rise of automation, artificial intelligence, uh, and you have millennials that now make up more than half the workforce. It's no longer the millennials coming. They're here and they're now the workforce. Uh, and these things are highly disruptive to almost every uh, employer, whether it's hitting profit margins or changing business models uh, or struggling to deal with uh, the different challenges that comes with a brand new workforce uh, as, you know, as they continue to grow and continue to try to tackle the challenges they're working on. And w why do I bring this up? I think in this you know, time of dynamic, constant change, uh, we have to support a transition as an organization to help each individual business become a learning business or a learning enterprise. Uh, and that is going to be critical uh, because, you know, I, I don't think, you know, and I think it was, it's been said a few times here, I, I don't think students are going to graduate for 20 years of school, whether it's high school, going into university, and then go into the workforce for 40 years and then be done. Uh, I think th those days are coming to a very quick end. I think that you're seeing now, everyone's going to have to become a lifelong learner. Uh, they're not only going to have to pick up those skills in the university, uh, they're now going to have to go back and get recertified, re-educated uh, throughout their entire career uh, as they move from one job to the next or as they move from one career to the next. Uh, and I think that presents a huge opportunity for educational institutions as well. Uh, because, you know, I don't think companies are going to be able to carry that full burden themselves. I think they're going to have to go back to school uh, we're going to have to find partnerships, or we're going to have to find new ways of, of helping to tackle this challenge. Uh, I also think when you, when, you, when you look at colleges that are ready for this, uh, they're, they're, they're coining it as sort of the non-traditional learner, which means you know, folks that are in the workplace or uh, older uh, learners coming back to, to school. Uh, and we have to be able to find new ways of reaching these learners. Uh, the traditional approach to you have to show up to class between eight and eight, <laughs> uh, and you know uh, you, can, you, you can't uh, have a job, you can't have uh, everything else going on in your life. I think it's those that's very hard for a non-traditional learner, uh, and so we have to find new ways as educational institutions to to tackle that. I also think you have this other uh, challenge, which is uh, this concept of having to have multiple skills in the same job and the blurring of all the lines in the disciplines. And what do I mean by that? So if, if you're a graduate from communications, in the past, uh, what, that, what that meant was you had to be really good at writing. Today, you have to be really good at writing, you have to be good at video, you have to be good at social media, analytics, and a whole other range of skills. Uh, same thing if you're a mobile app developer. Uh, in the past, it was just good enough to be a, a computer science grad or a programmer. Now you need to be an entrepreneur, you need to be a marketer, uh, and you need to be an app developer. And if you look at the uh, jobs, uh, those kind of jobs are growing at about twice the, the pace as a normal job that we would have had in the past. And so as educational institutions, we've got to think about uh, how do we actually support uh, developing these skills within uh, this future workforce. I also think it's an opportunity for real partnership, that we can start breaking down the traditional barriers here. Uh, because if you look at uh, learning, we need to be flexible, we need to be, be adaptive, we need to support a move to online and competency-based education. Uh, but we also need to be able to understand, how's this going to work in the workplace? How's this going to fit into the lives of each and every one of these learners uh, with all the other things that are happening? Uh, and, and to me, I, I think the only way for us to do that is in, in tight partnership and, and collaboration. Uh, I also think it's also a necessary thing. Like, this isn't a nice to do or a nice to have. It's a necessary uh, attribute. Because if you look at the millennials, this is something they grew up with. They've had digital learning experiences throughout. Uh, they live in a non demand world. Everything's digital. Uh, and the companies that are not moving down this direction uh, are going to be faced with a huge challenge when it comes to retention or attracting new talent into their organizations. Uh, and there's been study after study that shows how driving learning in terms of the building a culture of learning uh, has a huge impact on engagement and really supports uh, building a great culture within the organization that has a huge impact on business outcomes. So 
it, it has an impact. You know, in the past, you know, I would always get the questions of, well, where's the return on investment? If I was talking to a company, like, how do I actually measure the impact of this? Uh, and, you know, in the past, that was true. Like, traditional classroom experience, you really couldn't measure, did the learning occur uh, very effectively? Uh, and it was very hard to, to draw the connection points. Uh, but today, with, with, with analytics and uh, predictive analytics and, and understanding uh, all the different data points, you can, you can see competency being built uh, in your teams and in your, in your organization. And you can measure a real return on that investment. Uh, and to me, that's, that's going to be another big driver for the adoption of this uh, strategy of supporting lifelong learning uh, uh, throughout, our, uh, throughout the world. Uh, so we, yes, I'm a big believer that a lot of this is going to be done online, because I think that's the only way for us to, to really effectively deliver this experience uh, to the global uh, population. Uh, but I also think uh, it's not just about an economic return or technology. I, I also look at this as a, as a way for us to have a huge impact on us as people. Right? People are going to have to become more self-directed. They're going to take more ownership of their own skills. They're going to take more ownership of their own development. And they're going to become lifelong learners. And that has a, an impact not on just our businesses and our institutions, but on uh, us as a society. You know, and, and if we can get these learners to engage for a lifetime, uh, not only will they uh, be able to navigate all the different changes that are going to come in the future, they're going to be an inspiration to others. They're going to drive mentorship. They're going to help the next generation of uh, the workforce get the skills that they're going to be required. They're going to become teachers. Uh, and to me, you know, as a son of two teachers, this is a good thing. Uh, these are things that are going to really help propel us forward uh, you know, as, as we go forward. And I also think, oh, sorry. <laughs> I also think, uh, you know, when, 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 we, when, we, when we try to accomplish this, it's not just us doing this or D2L. It's, not, it's all of us as leaders in this room working together to tackle these challenges. How do we really work together to build uh, lifelong learning as a, as a key strategy? Uh, and because at the end of the day, for me, it's about reaching every learner. It's about helping them reach their full potential and, and recognizing that learning at the core is going to help us solve all the other world problems. And for me, that, that enables us to have a much brighter future uh, for us as a, you know, as a society uh, and us as, a, as an industry. So with that, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop and take a couple questions. So thank you very much for your time here today. I hope I made the case for lifelong learning. Any questions? And this is a stop sign, so if, so no questions. Thank you very much for your time.